let's talk about autonomy. Let's talk about the, the right of autonomy and some conditions and limitations. Uh, autonomy is a basic idea in ethics um, as it applies to the clients making choices about their, um, their decisions about medical care, etc. The problem is that the idea or the term autonomy is equivocal. It's met in different ways. So what I'm going to go through is what the term autonomy comes from, the sort of the, the etymology, the origin of the term, a little bit about the natural rights tradition, which is basically the political philosophy that is underlying a lot of the way that we talk about autonomy, in my view, largely to our detriment and confusion in the United States. Autonomy as a condition and then a little bit about informed consent as a client's right. Pardon my congestion. It's almond blossom season. So the term autonomy um, comes from two ancient Greek root words um, or, or roots. One of them is auto, which refers to self, and nomos, which refers to law or legislation. So autonomy is self-legislation. So it refers to a kind of control over oneself. Um, it refers to giving law to one's own action, controlling oneself. So it refers to the human being as being rational in making these choices, not lawlessness. That's important for the way the idea of autonomy is used in ethics. And in certain kinds of ethics, for instance, in uh, deontology, which is Kantian ethics, duty ethics, the idea of autonomy refers really specifically to acting according to reason and reason alone. So in Kantian ethics, it has a very restrictive sense than in other ideas of ethics. Um, but autonomy generally means uh, acting according to a law of one's own, acting in a way that is um, according to one's own principles. As a principle in professional ethics, first of all, clients are generally presumed to have the right to make autonomous choices about the services that professionals provide. So they're presumed to be able to make those choices. There are some exceptions that I'll talk about, but it, uh, an adult client that appears before any sort of ordinary professional, a doctor, a lawyer, a, um, a professor, a, a public accountant, whatever, those professionals will just presume that the person, the client, the patient, the student, whatever, will have the right to make choices and be able to make those choices. That's the starting point. That's a basic starting point. Part of what our ideas about autonomy come from is the natural rights political tradition. Now, I don't want to get too far into this, but this is a, a political and ideological tradition that, for the most part, just leads us astray in our understanding of autonomy when it comes to ethics. Um, because it's confused with the idea of political liberty, which is a much broader and very different kind of concept um, as it was developed by people like Thomas Hobbes in Leviathan and especially in John Locke in the Second Treatise of Government. Um, Locke was writing a kind of um, post facto rationale defending the, the bourgeois in the Glorious Revolution um, which was around 1688, <clears throat> um, Hobbes was writing um, an argument about the limitation on the rights of the monarchy. And when Locke was writing, especially in the Second Treatise of Government, what he was trying to argue for was that there was the, 
a right of individuals as individuals to do what they choose to do, that a government didn't grant them those rights, which was the English tradition up to that point, but that the rights came from nature or from God. Uh, that changed everything in the English common law, in the English understanding of, of the rights of persons, and primarily of landed persons, of bourgeois persons, and uh, really made it possible for there to be the rise of a capitalist class in England. Um, the, the English were way ahead of other nations in developing a capitalist class, a bourgeois capitalist class. And John Locke was one of the, the sort of political thinkers that paved the way for that. The Second Treatise of Government was also the source of a lot of the language and ideas of the founders. Uh, the, of the U.S. Uh, in particular, the language that you see in the Declaration of Independence is pretty much lifted straight from the Second Treatise of Government. This passage in particular, it's basically plagiarized from Locke. Um, we hold these truths, you know this language, it's from the Declaration of Independence by Thomas Jefferson. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are blah, blah, blah. Um, well, <clears throat> there's some interesting features about this. Uh, what does self-evident mean? What does equal mean? What does endowed by their creator mean? What does it mean for them to be unalienable? What I want to get at um, here is the, the idea that liberty really was um, an idea that had no limit to it in this, this political model of the natural rights tradition. In other words, um, liberty was so fully extensive, it could ap apply to anything anyone chose to do. You, you were within your liberty to do absolutely anything, provided it didn't interfere with the liberty or life of another person. Um, that was the only limitation on it that John Locke could see. And that's not what we mean by autonomy. Autonomy is narrower than that. But the way that people typically understand autonomy, it gets confused with Jefferson and Locke's idea of liberty. And uh, that makes the way people understand autonomy in an ethics sense um, just not as clear as it really ought to be. Um, you see that in the way people think about uh, autonomy in ethics cases. You see that in the way people think about um, what happens in um, famous cases that come to public view. Um, one other comment, pursuit of happiness basically doesn't mean anything here. That, as far as I can tell, it just means what you use your liberty for. So all Jefferson really is saying is life, liberty, and liberty. Liberty and the pursuit of happiness, which would be what you do with liberty. There's a reason for that. He was writing a declaration of independence for a nation in which people held slaves, held other human beings in slavery. And so um, he was being very cautious to write something in which he didn't want to indicate that everyone was going to be capable of owning property, which was the, the third term in John Locke's original. The unalienable rights in John Locke's second treatise of government were life, liberty, and property. Um, not everyone had the right to property, according to the Declaration of Independence. That's a very important distinction. When you're writing founding documents for a nation where people are going to own other human beings, or at least claim to own other human beings, and you're trying to legitimate that, uh, that practice in founding documents, you have to do some pretty fancy dancing to try to make that seem like a legitimate practice by law. And this is, John, uh, this is Thomas Jefferson trying to figure out a way uh, to, to make that look, look legit. So... Um, one other thing about this. 
endowed by their creator with them being unalienable. Um, this is the well, why they're called natural rights. No one grants them to us. They're just there. You have them by dint of being a human being, uh, unless you are a person who is held as a slave, apparently. They're unalienable, again, unless you're a person who's held as a slave, apparently, which means that you can't give them away. They can't be sold unless you're a person who's held as a slave, apparently. Um, so there should be a great big old asterisk there and a footnote. But that's what the idea was supposed to mean, that uh, they cannot be given away, sold, changed, and that you have them just because you're a human being. And equal, except when they're not. Anyway, um, in relation to this idea of liberty, autonomy is, it, it's shifty. It's not the same thing. We can talk about it in terms of the right, but right is not quite the right term for it, I think, when you talk about autonomy. But we can talk about it as the right of a competent adult person to make decisions for himself or herself. Um, so where these cross paths, for instance, a Supreme Court decision came down on medical decision-making and declared that the right of an, a, a competent adult person to make medical decisions for themselves was absolute, including a medical decision that would lead to that patient's death, like refusing medical treatment. So the Supreme Court kind of intervened in a situation which was in the first place about an ethical question, but then became a legal question because this person's, the patient's decision was not respected by the medical personnel. They disagreed about whether it was ethical to let this person choose to refuse treatment and thereby hasten their own death. They disagreed that that was an ethical thing for them to do. And so that person ended up having to sue for the right to refuse this treatment. It went all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court agreed. In that case, by the way, the person then uh, accepted treatment. How about that? Now I'm going to talk about autonomy as a condition. So we can say that autonomy is a right to make decisions, but autonomy is also a condition of a person. And when we talk about the condition of being autonomous, that's a, another way in which the concept of autonomy is equivocal, where we use the word autonomy, where it would be more cautious, more precise, to speak of being competent or incompetent. Being competent or incompetent here doesn't mean being able or unable to, to uh, do things well or something like that. It doesn't mean competent or incompetent in your particular field of endeavor. It means being able or unable to make decisions for yourself. Right? So we're talking about the capacity of a client to make decisions for themselves. So what makes a competent client competent? Are you adult? Are you conscious? Are you sane? Are you rational? Or are you under 18? It, it's much more complicated than that. And here's a story that, um, that's where we get into some problems. How do you determine or who determines competency or incompetency? Sometimes you need a psychiatric evaluation to determine this. Who decides who calls for the psychiatric evaluation? Good question. Often it is the professional's um, privilege in certain situations to uh, have that psychiatric determination of competency or incompetency. But sometimes it's a little more cut and dry. 
competency is presumed for people over 18 and incompetency is presumed for people under 18. This is how silly I think this is. Um, so when you went to bed aged 17 years, 364 days, you were not competent to make medical decisions for yourself. And then when you woke up the next morning, suddenly you were? It's very strange. Well, I know obviously we have to draw a line somewhere, but it's really arbitrary. We draw lines arbitrarily. And with regard to the decisions we make for ourselves, some of those decisions are 21 years, some of them are 12. What I have in mind there is, in some jurisdictions, you can be tried as an adult for felonies as young as 12 years old. So you're treated like an adult for making a decision to commit a felony. Um, you may not be legal to do many other things, like drive a car, but you would be legally uh, entitled to be treated like an adult for having committed a felony at age 12. That's so strange. And of course, renting a car on your own, 25 for some reason. That's so weird. Uh, my point is that the idea of when you are competent and not competent is a really iffy one. It's much messier than um, that very simplistic model of just, I like. It was written in an article from, I believe, 1977 by this guy named Samuel Gorovitz. He was a, a fellow, I think, of the um, Hastings Center for Medical Ethics, which was kind of the first medical ethics think tank in the world um, when it was in New York State. He wrote an article about um, teaching. He was a, a teacher as well. He taught, taught medicine. And... Um, one of the things he did was go around following along um, another uh, another teacher, another med you know doctor teaching doctors, and watch what they were doing, and then talk to his own students about what they had just seen, and that's what happened here. So the story he told is this: um, they were going through rounds with this doctor, um, this was a, um, an obstetric, obstetric doctor. So this was somebody who had just delivered a baby and was talking to the new mother. And the new mother was a little tense. The doctor was explaining that the baby the newborn baby had a small fistula between the left and right ventricles of its heart. And it sometimes happens. Um, it is serious, but it's something that can be pretty easily repaired surgically and it needs to be done. Um, it is, it's pretty serious, but it, it's a very successful surgery. It can be done pretty pretty easily. And then the doctor um, drew a quick diagram to show what the surgery repair looked like and what the situation was. So, so it comes into the first atrium and then goes into the ventricle, gets pumped out into the lungs returns into the other atrium. But see, between the two ventricles, that's where the fistula is, a little hole. And so the blood mixes in there. So it's just a sketch, right? Just a very, just a very schematic sketch of how atriums and ventricles work and how the blood goes out and comes back in and it, it mixes together in the two ventricles. So, the doctor leaves, and then later on, uh, someone comes in to get the new mother's signature on an informed consent document, and just to make sure, asks the new mother if she understands, and 
what the surgery is all about. And she says, yes, I understand perfectly. My baby has a square heart. So what Gorovitz said about this is consent of a client, the autonomous choices of a client is always to, he says, a given description of what the medical treatment is. And that given description is up to the professional to provide. In other words, so much depends on how the client is informed of the treatment or the proposal for their service. If it's not clarified, if it's not given in a way that educates the client, the patient, so that they can fully understand and give an educated consent, then they aren't truly consenting. In other words, consent is conditional upon truly understanding the situation, not merely being able to make a choice, but having information and a depth of knowledge of the situation that takes time, patience, um, mutual understanding, empathy, and work on the part of the professional to make sure that the patient or client really has. Sometimes when I've used this article in professional ethics classes, um, students have laughed about, you know, this woman um, misunderstanding the situation in this way. And, you know, even like making fun of her, saying, well, what's wrong with her? Is she stupid or something? But if you consider the situation, you know, she has a newborn and a doctor has just told her her newborn needs heart surgery. She might be a little tense. Um, the, and all sorts of other information that we don't know, that Gorbis doesn't talk about. There could be a language barrier. Um, she, could be, uh, she could be under the influence of painkilling drugs. Um, she could be a drug addict. She could be, um, there could be any number of cultural understandings that are, that are different for her than for the doctor. All sorts of things could be going on that the doctor in his story wasn't paying attention to. And again, that would take time, that would take patience, that would take empathy that the doctor didn't provide. So informed consent should be educated consent, he said. Um, it's pretty interesting to me. He also uh, was really critical of informed consent documents um, and the way they were treated. And my experience is that they're still treated kind of the same way now that they were, you know, now close to 50 years ago in the 70s when he wrote this article, um, that they're treated as just something you have to write your name on. Um, that you're not really given a lot of time or encouragement to read them carefully, and they're not written in a way that ordinary people can understand or really should be expected to understand. And there isn't someone to talk you through it. So this presents a big challenge to that natural rights tradition. First of all, the natural rights tradition has more of an all or nothing view of autonomy. And it presumes our equality, where instead what Gorovitz gets at is that there's a real difference in our autonomy because there's a real difference in our power. And in the natural rights view, those ambiguous cases where someone can be sort of autonomous and sort of not autonomous, um, there's not really a way of handling those. I haven't even mentioned the story about um, my acquaintance Spaz in Pittsburgh, but maybe I'll talk about that story some other time. 
Then there's the implications of this. So autonomy is limited. It develops. People who have limited autonomy still have the right to autonomy, and they still deserve moral respect. They still deserve consideration. Just because your autonomy is not something you can practice doesn't mean that it doesn't exist or that decisions you might have made or values that you might hold dear don't count anymore. Um, if I were found unconscious in a ditch somewhere because my Meniere's disease kicked in and I fell off my bicycle into a ditch and was unconscious, it could happen. If that were to occur and um, paramedics, uh, you know, were universal spirit willing, found me there in the ditch and were helping me, I would be unconscious and so I would be incompetent to make decisions. Well, does that mean that the autonomy and right to autonomy I have wouldn't matter anymore? I would like to think that it still would matter and that things about my autonomy would still matter, that respecting my autonomy would still matter in certain ways. For instance, and we'll get into some of this perhaps later on in the semester, um, I think that the best way to understand why we have a right to confidentiality of information about us, the best way to think about that is that it's a kind of autonomy right. We have the right to control. We have the autonomy right to control where information about us goes. Um, so that right still exists, even if I'm unconscious. Stuff like that. And they ought to be able to respect the values that I have. For instance, if you have an advanced medical directive, they should respect it, even if you're incompetent. That's the point of having an advanced medical directive.